and tonight I am here to answer all of your training and behavior questions. Um, since we are using the, the newer platform that's working, yay, um, please when you log on or join, um, put your name and where you're from because all I see is Facebook user and in order to enter you into the drawing, I need to have your name and what state you are um, coming from. Um, I was going to do this at my office tonight, but I am actually just going to do it from my living room um, because my three dogs are crashed out on the couch and I have, hi Kayla, I'm going to start writing down names as you get on. Um, I have a board and train with me still from, that's a separation anxiety dog. And so I either keep the dog, take the dog with me. Um, and I, I didn't want to create her because she still panics. So what's going on with him? Sorry. One of my dogs is like behind me. Um, we have Rosalie and Anita. I didn't know how many people would join tonight just because of Thanksgiving. So we may not go as long depending on how many people we have. But um, anyway, since I have four dogs here and one has separation anxiety, I figured it would be easier just to do it um, from here. And that way um, I don't like two dogs into work and they can all just be laying on the couch as I answer questions. So, um, oh, yarn it out. You have a pie in the oven. Awesome. So I have to admit, I um, had COVID for two and a half weeks. Um, I still did the live Q&As because I could just them from my couch and I just put a little bit of makeup on and nobody knew but from having and then it took another week to get all my strength back but the silver lining is that I lost 20 pounds from COVID so somebody brought me a pumpkin pie today and I actually gave it to my cousin because um, I like I'm trying to go off of all sugar and not gain the weight back that I lost and I'd still like to lose 20 more. So um, tomorrow at Thanksgiving, it's going to be a real boring day. I mean, not boring because my family will be there, but I'm vegetarian, so I don't eat turkey. And basically all I eat are mashed potatoes and gravy. Um, no pie. So it's basically just a day off. And luckily, I really love mashed potatoes and gravy. I could eat them all day, every day. So, um, and my mom, just for me, uses almond milk instead of regular milk to make them. So that's awesome. Um, okay, so Anita's asking, how do I teach putting toys away? Um, that's a great question. I actually did that with a client this week. So the first thing I do is teach a take so I teach a dog to like take something and then drop it. So, so take, drop it. And you can start with, um, with like a toy that they're going to take anyway. Um, let me see if I can, I don't have any treats with me, so I'm not sure Jade will do it, but take, take, take. Yes. Sometimes I'll teach them, take out. Yeah, good girl. So hopefully you can see that. So I teach a take. Um, I actually sometimes start with a post-it note and like play with it and get the dog to just grab it. And then I teach them out. Um, and then once they, or a draw, um, once they can do a take and then a drop, um, then I'll kind of teach it right by the toy box. And so I'll do take and then um, point to the toy box and say drop um, and teach them to, to drop their toy in the toy box. 
Um, and then you can start working on your distance. So yeah, the first step is to teach take. Once you teach take, then you can start putting stuff on the ground and say take, or you can then change your cue to like pick it up. Um, and so you teach them to pick it up and then you can take teach them to then drop it into their toy box. So um, yeah, that, you know what, that would be a great um, little trick exercise to work on, really good shaping exercise. If you do it, um, please film it for us because I would love to see it. Um, and I actually worked with a client um, several months ago who had taught her dog that. And um, this was a dog that's very human aggressive. So um, it's like I, when I was sitting in the living room, I couldn't really like stand up and like praise the dog, but she showed me how her dog can pick up all of her toys and put them in the toy box. It was pretty amazing. So yeah, I need if you do it, film it. Um, I'd love to see it. Okay, I need to scroll up because I know there's lots of questions. And um, Kayla, my dog gets really vocal and rough with other dogs. How can I train him impulse control and how to play? He was a larger dog. Oh, he has a larger dog that he plays with like this that doesn't mind, but other dogs do. Um, so what I do is um, I will do a lot of timeouts. So I do like it. So in puppy class, if a dog starts playing too rough, then we just do an easy like, okay, gotcha. And we just grab their collar like they're not in trouble. We just do a, a one minute timeout, let them calm down and then let them back to play. Um, another really good thing to do is if you know somebody that has a really good adult dog that can correct without being aggressive, um, that would be awesome. Um, and if you, if it looks like your dog's being violent, then you want to make sure, like if this is at a dog park and stuff, like some dogs just aren't a good fit for dog parks. So I usually prefer to have those dogs, you know, do doggy play dates with one or two dogs, um, things like that. Um, because if it, if it looks aggressive and violent, it could be that your dog's not having fun. Um, and if other dogs, like if there's a dog that doesn't mind and doesn't correct, then your dog's getting reinforced for doing that. So sometimes it's really good. So my dog, this is Maddie, right here. She's the one I use to um, socialize dogs like that because she has never been aggressive with another dog, but she is amazing about like correcting bad behavior without hurting a dog or being aggressive with the dog. So she just does a correction. Um, the dog backs off, and then then the younger dogs learn what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. If you don't have that, then I would do the timeouts. Um, and in some puppy classes, um, sometimes dogs get timeouts every five seconds. And other times, um, you know, they can play for a minute, they get a timeout. Some don't get a timeout for the whole 15 minutes. So, um, so it just kind of depends on the dog. And, um, but one thing I have noticed is the more timeouts they get, the more they kind of learn that that behavior is not appropriate and they probably need more time to like decompress. Also, if you notice that dogs like, a lot of dogs will play, 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 and then they'll, they'll like stop for a second. And they might do a shake off. Um, but if they pause, I usually praise them for that because that means they're, they're like giving themselves a timeout. And so I'll say, oh, good dog, good timeout. So I just praise them for that because they're kind of giving themselves a little break. So, um, 
Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry I had COVID too. At the time, it was the worst thing in the world, but now, um, you know, the silver lining is I got a jump start on my diet, so it was it was good. Um, okay, Sarah, my puppy is suffering from separation anxiety. Um, how do I start to correct this? Okay, that's a great question because if you were here at the beginning, I have a um, separation anxiety dog with me right now that's doing board and train. Um, and when you say separation anxiety, like what does that look like? Is your dog like barking, whining in the crate or is the dog like having accidents? Um, destructive things like that um dogs that like vocalize non-stop while you're gone or um like pee and poop everywhere or some dogs are very very destructive um the first thing the separation anxiety is you have to suspend absences and i would say if you have a young puppy um, you can probably just start to like, you know, go behind a wall, come back, go behind a wall. And we start with seconds, like two seconds, and then come back and then go out of sight for five seconds and then come back. And I usually start with like a baby gate. So the dog that I have with me now, um, I have a baby gate up. And so I put her on one side and I'm like on the other side in the kitchen doing dishes. So she can still see me, but she can't actually get to me. And then we've um, kind of worked up to um, like I'll walk in the bathroom, close the door, open the door, come out. So we're literally starting with seconds. Um, and then get to the point, build up to where you can go out and get the mail, come back in. Um, drive the car, you know, out of the driveway back in, but you want to work up to that. It's a good idea to get a camera or you can use Zoom, which works amazing, um, and watch your dog. And so you can go outside and watch your dog and right at the point where you feel like your dog is starting to, to get um, at that threshold, where they might start panting a little or pacing, you want to come back. Um, because separation anxiety to a dog is like a full-blown panic attack. And actually, the dog that I have with me, um, I text their, her owners who are in Hawaii, and I, I said, I really think this dog needs to be on medication. So we are using medication as well. Um, depending on how old your puppy is, again, um, sometimes they're just not used to being um, by themselves. So you can just start, um, I would start crate training as well, but sometimes um, confinement anxiety can make separation anxiety worse. So I would make sure that if you are creating your puppy that it's like Disneyland in there, like they have chew toys, they have fun stuff to do, and then literally like walk out of the room, come back. Now the rule about, and this is kind of where the fine line with, with puppy is. The rule with puppies and crate training is if they're whining or crying, you don't want to let them out because then that reinforces that behavior. Um, so with separation anxiety though, that's not the case because they are like having a panic attack. So you want to make sure that your puppy really is suffering from true separation anxiety before you do this. Otherwise, you're going to be reinforcing that behavior um, of whining and barking. So um, I would, if you wouldn't mind emailing me, um, I'm going to type my email in here just because I could talk um, I could talk for the whole hour on separation anxiety. It's, it's a deep, it's a deep topic. Um, I could help you find a trainer in your area. You might need to work with a trainer. Oh, now I'm trying to get this to scroll again and it doesn't want to scroll. Um, 
So, but tell me kind of what that looks like. Is it just like when the puppy's in a crate, they're barking, whining? That's probably just puppy stuff. If if you're seeing destructive accidents, nonstop barking, um, then yes, that then you can start like a separation anxiety protocol. The nice thing about separation anxiety, I mean, it's one of the harder things to work through, but the trainer doesn't actually need to be there. So I could actually help you remotely with, with that, or I could help you find a trainer that's close to you that could help you um, through this because it, um, we do want to correct it. It's easier to correct it when it's early than later. Um, my fourth pit bull had separation anxiety and only I rescued him, so I didn't know it and the rescue didn't know it. And the first time I left him alone, I had crated him because I didn't know if he was potty trained. He broke out of the crate and um, I used to play in a band. And so I was gone for like four hours and he spent the whole four hours trying to dig out of a room and like ruined carpet, um, door frame, there were teeth marks. And I felt awful that, because I had no idea, but I just felt awful that he was that panicked. So um, yeah, email me and give me a little bit more information. Like tell me what, what it looks like. Like what is your dog doing? Um, okay, Nat T, what is a good harness? Um, my favorite harness is the Freedom Harness. Um, and it's because it's a, a front clip. So dogs have what's called opposition reflex. So all the harnesses that clip in back, that pull, when dogs feel pressure here, they push against it, which is why sled dogs pull. Um, so I like the front clip because then if they pull, it turns them back towards you. So an easy walk does that. The reason I like the freedom harness though, is it comes with its own leash um, and it has a front and a back clip. So you have a little bit more control. If the dog starts pulling, you can grab like the front part of the leash and turn them towards you. I also do this, do the other one where I go in the opposite direction. So if the puppy starts to pull, I turn this way. If they pull that way, I turn this way. And then when they run to catch up with me, I click and treat when they're right by my side. Now with puppies, I don't teach a formal heel because I think it's good for, for dogs to sniff and explore and get that mental enrichment. And I let them do that as long as they're not pulling. So another one that you can do is drop treats like every step and then every two steps, every five steps. Um, but the Freedom Harness is my favorite. And right now, none of my dogs have theirs on or I would show you. But um, I just did a video for Pupford on the Freedom Harness. And I don't know if they've posted it yet, but if they haven't, check it out. Or on their Facebook page, look under like videos or resources. Because I, I show you how to adjust it. I show you how it's used, um, stuff like that. So I, I was really excited when Pupford started to sell them because um, you can get them on Amazon um, and you can get them right from the people that, that make them. But the last order I did from them, it, it took like eight weeks to get them, but it was because of COVID and they, you know, they had a, short staff. So I like that um, Pupford is selling them now and um, so you can get them quicker. But yes, that is my go-to harness and all of my clients who have really strong dogs, I always recommend the Freedom Harness because it's a lot easier um, to control them. And then if you want to give your dog more freedom, you can unclip the back and then the handle actually slides up and you're talking about freedom. But then if they pull, you, it'll still like turn them back towards you so that they can't pull. Um, okay, Travis. So when you guys ask your questions, don't forget
to put your state. So I need your name and state to be entered into the drawing. Okay, struggling with behavioral issue, issues from person to person. My pup listens to me perfect, but struggles listening to the wife. Play bites her and, eat, and is even too misbehaved to walk alone for her until I'm off work. Um, okay, let me, I see you have another one underneath. I'm trying to get it to scroll. Um, six month old lab. So I, I actually see that a lot. It's kind of common in houses where dogs will listen to one and not the other. Um, for the most part, dogs don't generalize. So um, if, so if you're the one working with the dog the most, the dog's going to listen to you. Um, when your wife goes to work with the dog, and, and for a while, I would have your wife do the majority of the training. So start with the name game, start with watch me, start with hand targeting, sit. Um, also have your wife feed the dog, the dog, so that everything comes from her and the training comes from her. So it kind of puts her in a in a leadership position. Also, since your dog is six months old, you're nearing or at that adolescent stage where your dog might, um, you basically, you know, have a teenager. And so the dog might try to see what, what um, he or she, oh, I can't, I can't remember if you told me what sex your, um, dog is so I'll just say she um so she's at an age where she might try to see what she can get away with so we want to put your wife kind of in a leadership position um also since dogs don't generalize if you do something with your dog such as down and you teach the dog down then when your wife does it she should start over like with the lore um because just because um, your dog does it for you doesn't mean that the dog will do it for your wife. So whenever you change criteria, meaning that you train with a different person or different place, um, then you want to lower another criteria, which means like make it easier, start over with the lure, um, things like that. Um, and then you know, on walks, I would start with like, watch me. And as your wife is starting to like walk the dog, do a lot of like, watch me, click treat. You know, watch me, click treat. Um, and then if your dog's pulling, you can turn another way. Again, if the dog is sniffing and exploring, I, that's totally fine. I think that's very enriching and I don't think um, that's misbehaving at all. As long as the dog's not pulling. Um, so maybe, you know, even wait until you're off work and go for a walk and then you start out walking the dog and then hand the leash off to your wife so that your dog kind of gets going in the right direction and then you hand off the leash. Um, so hopefully that, that answered, um, your question. I, I have a dog that's two um, that kind of does that too. Like she listens to me and, and does things, but she doesn't always do it for other people. Sometimes she will, but sometimes she just looks at them like, um, yeah, I don't think so. So I tell them, you know, use the treat, start with the lure, and then she'll do it for them. So you just kind of have to remember. Um, also, you want to look at, at a location where your wife wife is training. Um, start indoors where it's not very distractive, distracted, and then go outside, like maybe backyard, front yard, then on walks, um, so that you build build up. So with any behavior, you should always um, think about you know duration distance, distractions, different places, and different people. So like have different people um, 
do it. So like when I have Jade out and somebody wants to say hi, I will ask them, I'll say, okay, ask her to sit and then you can say hi to her. So, so she's learning how to sit for other people as well for attention and treats. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question though, no, and it is, it is kind of um, common. In fact, I was at a, a lady's house today who, um, the dog's a little skittish, but she was actually doing everything for me, but then when I had the mom practice, the dog wouldn't always do it for her. Um, but I think a lot of it's just because I've done it for so long um, that it just comes natural. And I always have to remember, like, um, it's like almost the second nature muscle memory for me, but other people are doing it for the first time. So it's a good lesson in patience for me. But it's interesting to see the dog, like, do stuff for one person but not the other. So, um yeah, make sure your wife is really involved in the training. Maybe start with the food lore. You can also use higher value treats so that the dog likes working for your wife because with you, maybe the dog gets training treats, but when working with your wife, the dog gets like hot dogs or something like that. Um, okay. Um, I just got a Golden Doodle and Cavapoo. Both are the same age, 10 weeks. The Golden Doodle won't let the Cavapoo play with any toys and she tries to keep other dogs away from me. How do I get her to behave? Um, so that's a good question. Um, it almost sounds like the Golden Doodle is resource guarding toys and... Um, and is resource guarding you. So you probably have to kind of go through um, a behavior modification um, program. So what what I do with resources is, is like, my, and it depends on what the resource is. My dogs don't really care about toys, so I can have toys all over the place and they're never gonna fight about them. But if I give something like a yak chew or a bully stick, I separate them. So I'll have one behind a baby gate, one in a crate, one outside, so that they totally get to enjoy it without having to worry about the other dog trying to come up and take it. Um, one thing you can do is what's called abandonment training. So if you're sitting with the Cavapoo or with the Golden Doodle, so let's say um, we'll use Vixen. This is my separation anxiety dog right now. So let's say I'm, I'm here like petting Vixen and another dog comes up and Vixen growls, then that's going to make me stand up and go away. So, so her resource guarding me or growling at another dog makes me leave. I just get up and walk away. Um, the other thing that you can do is... Um, um make it so that good things happen when the the cavapoo gets close so like you can put the golden doodle i would do a back tie or tie the dog to something so the golden doodle can't go after the cavapoo but then have the golden doodle you know with the toy walk the cavapoo by and if the golden doodle stays calm toss a treat so that in the golden doodle's mind, it's like, oh, good things happen when the cavapoo walks by because I get treats. And you want to start at a good distance where the golden doodle is not going to react and then slowly decrease. Now, um, I, I consider it normal body language like if a golden doodle has a bone or a toy and kind of does a lip curl or a growl, that's just... Um, that dog's way of saying, hey, this is mine, you need to back off. Um, but it's not okay to like attack another dog or, or things like that. Um, and you can also do the same thing with like with you. So if you have somebody to help you. So it's like the Cavapoo's over there, the Golden Doodle's right here. And it's like, um, just notice the dog and treat. 
and treat. And then have the Cavapoo get one step closer and treat. So that again, in the Golden Doodle's mind, it's like, oh, good things happen, I get treat when the Cavapoo gets closer. Then if the Golden Doodle growls, you get up and walk away. So, so that behavior makes you leave. Um, so those, those are just gonna give you like some ideas. Um, okay, when I get my pup, I'll be raising him to be a service dog. Do you know how to train a dog to warn you about different attacks? For me, it would be migraines and panic attacks. Oh, it is so interesting that you would ask that question because this little girl right here, the black one, hey, over here. So she's actually being trained um to be a migraine alert dog um because i get migraines so it can take up to two years and you have to do a lot of work on public access so being able to take your dog you know into public places but the short answer is when i start to feel like i'm getting a migraine i have like those the um you know those cotton rolls that they use at the dentist so I will put those in my mouth and get them just soaked in saliva. Um, you, I use gloves because you don't want any scent on it. And if you've eaten within the last half hour or like brushed your teeth or something, then you can't do it. So um, it has to be at least 30 minutes since you've had anything in your mouth. Gum, I've had to quit chewing gum sometimes, which is awful for me because I usually always have gum. But you can't have just brush your teeth or eaten or chewed gum because because the what the dog does is detects the um, chemical changes in your body. So same thing with panic attacks, um, they start to to detect the um, the chemical changes. So I'll just use migraine because that's the one I'm most familiar with. So um, after you get your samples, then um, you, you can either use tweezers or I usually just use rubber gloves. And then you put it in a baggie, put it in another baggie, so you double baggie it. And then put it in a, and it has to be like a good Ziploc bag. Then put it in a Tupperware and put it in the freezer. And then mark the date because they're only good for six months. Um, so then you can start, um, when we work on it, like I'll take um, one sample out. And I started with just two boxes. So I put the sample in one box and I would bring my dog out, let her sniff the boxes. And if she stopped and spent more time on the one that had the sample in it, I would click and treat. Um, so that she starts to learn that when she alerts on that sample um, or on that scent, that she gets rewarded. Then you have to teach your dog an alert. So whether um, we were doing like um, touch, like only my leg, like touch and hold, but she actually did an alert a week and a half ago where she got really restless and she was pawing at me. So we might change her alert. Um, I, I don't know yet. But so yeah, you do teach an alert as well. Um, you could so, um, teach her to pick up cues on like panic attacks. So that if, um, if there's certain things you do before you have a panic attack, um, you can teach that kind of to the dog as this is your cue to do this. So if you see me doing this, I want you to do this. So like I'm working with a guy right now who has really severe PTSD and when he starts to get anxious, the dog will actually stand in front of him and push against him. And so it just kind of is like deep pressure um, therapy and it helps calm the, the guy down. So the dog can tell when the guy starts to get anxious and um, you can teach them to like sit on your feet or to push against you, things like that. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of aspects to that and just understand there's no guarantees in behavior. So like not every dog will work. 
Um, but you want to start the basic obedience stuff um, for public access. And then when you feel a migraine, um, or if you know that you're getting a panic attack, um, you know, like do the same thing. I don't know if you get like physical cues or um, that, that, that you could use. If not, do the same thing, but just keep your swabs different. So just say like, these are my migraine swabs. These are my panic attack swabs. Keep them in the freezer. And when you use them for training, you actually want to use them when they're still frozen. Once they thaw, the scent is gone. So um, yeah, and if I can help you remotely, we could set up a remote training session um, through Cupford. So I will just put my email in there and um, you can reach out to me um, or you can like look for a um, trainer like in your area that does service dogs. But yeah, so there's there's basically two different aspects of it. There's the public access stuff, and then there is the task force. So the stuff that you need your dog to do for you. Um, Kayla, let's see, when he goes back, he is just back at it. Unfortunately, I don't have any other dogs he can play with. And when we did try, he got rough and scared her. Um, do you have like a doggy daycare place where he could go play? But I'm really picky about doggy daycare. They have to have a lot of people in depending on how many dogs. So if there are 30 dogs in the room, they need to have three to four people watching. Because that way he can go play, but there's staff there that can interrupt the behavior um and hopefully good dogs that will correct without um being aggressive um and if you know other people that have dogs like you don't necessarily have to have the dog but like um if you know other people that have really well behaved dogs um you could try that um Otherwise, you just have to kind of keep at it, like keep doing those timeouts and um, just letting them know like, okay, if you play that rough, you're gonna get a timeout. Because what happens is the dog can actually go over threshold. And I've seen this happen where they play, they play really rough and then they get playing too rough and the next minute you know they're fighting. Um, and you're right, the, the wrong dog could be like, oh yeah, I don't think so, that's not gonna happen. And um, do more than correct. So you want to be careful with that as well. Um, oh, hi, Emily from Virginia. Emily, you don't have to tell me where you're from because I already know where you're from. Um, okay, my dog is growling and snapping when we are trying to get him to leave it. He knows the command, but if he doesn't want to give it up, he will start growling and showing teeth. Any suggestions? Um, yeah, so one thing that you can, so with Leave It, and I think I teach it a little bit different than Zach George, if you're watching, doing his videos. Um, when I do Leave It, the reward is always of equal or higher value than what I'm asking the dog to leave. Because if he's got a bully stick, and I'm asking him to leave that. And as a reward, I'm just going to get him a milk bone. He's going to be like, yeah, I don't think so. I'm keeping the bully stick. So, so what I will do is I'll start with something in my hand. I should have brought my treat back in. Then I could show you. It's in my car. So I'll start with a treat in my hand. And I'll say, leave it. And the dog might sniff and like lick and stuff. And as soon as they back away and leave it, I click, but then I give them something better. So if I'm, so I start with a milk bone, I ask them to leave a milk bone, but they get a better training treat. Then I ask them to leave like a piece of cheese, but they get a piece of chicken. Then I might ask them to leave a piece of pork, but they get steak. So no matter what I'm asking them to leave, the um, other 
the, the tree, the reward always has to be better. Then if he's growling, I would also do trades. So let's say I give my dog a yak chew. Um, then I might show them another yak chew or something that they, they like more than that, like a stuffed marrow bone or a bully stick. And then I'll say drop it. And then as soon as they drop it, I click give them the new item and then pick up the yak chew. And then I actually might see if they want to trade back or give it back when they're done with the bully stick or, you know, and if you don't want to wait for them to eat like a whole bully stick, use something high value like chicken or bacon or something like that. Then when they're done eating the bacon, give the original item back. So I've used this analogy before, but it's kind of like if you let somebody borrow your car and when they bring it back, it's full of gas, totally detailed, they washed it. You're like, oh, heck yeah, you can take my car. It comes back better than when I gave it to you. That's what we want the dog to think. So it's like, if you give up your, whatever you have, I'll give you this. Plus, I'm going to give you your, your original item back. So to the dog, it's like, oh, heck yeah, I'll, you can have it because I get this plus I get this back. Um, so, but I do that different because trades are different than leave it. Trade is like, you know, drop it, I'll give you this. And then sometimes I'll give you your original item back. If it's something they're not supposed to have, like socks or something that could hurt them, then I... I give them the item and then I take this one and it goes away. Um, but you always have to trade with something that's equal or higher value. And that's, that's how you get around the growling and showing teeth. It's like, oh, what do you have? Oh, wow, you have something better. So it'd be like my little cousin who, you know, he might have a five, well, let's say he has a $2 bill. And um, if I collected $2 bills, I might say, oh, hey, if you give me your $2 bill, I'll give you a $5 bill. And he's like, serious? Okay. And then I get the $2 bill that I'm collecting, and he gets a $5 bill. Um, so it has to be better. Um, and I do that separate from leave it because with leave it, um, the way I teach leave it is you don't ever get it, but you get something better. Because leave it to me is like, and it's because of where I live, is like skunk, porcupine, deer, um, moose, snakes, whatever. So it's like, I want you to leave that, but if you do, I will give you something better. Um, and then I start with my hands, and then... I might start with like, um, I don't know if you can see. So then I'll, then I'll like put it on my leg and I'll say, leave it. And if the dog goes for it, I cover it. And then if they back away, I uncover it. If they go for it, I cover it. As long, and then when they back away and can just look at it, then I'll click and give them the better item and this goes away. Um, and then I will practice it on leash. So it's harder to leave things that are moving so unleash them, I'll like throw something and say, leave it. And if the dog doesn't, then I slowly back up and start to reel them in. And as soon as the dog turns towards me, I click, give them the better item. Then they'll usually want to go back. So I'll let them just get just far enough. So I, when we're doing class, I always tell people, pretend like this item is a porcupine. How close are you going to let your dog get to a porcupine? So then the dog goes back, leave it. And then if the dog turns back towards you, click treat. If not, start to back up. So you don't yank them, but you can start to back up and, and even reel them in with the leash if you need to. And as soon as they focus on you, click, give the better item. So I think if you do it that way, um, that will that will really help with with the growling and the resource guarding. Um, okay, I'm gonna write down a few more names. So Julie, okay, New York, awesome. Um, okay.
Okay, Julie is asking, we started to have our puppy ring the bell when she has to go out. So I showed her every time she rings the bell, I say outside and open the door. Is this the correct way? Yeah, you can do it that way. Um, so does she ring the bell herself? So what I do is I, um, I do hand targeting. So I teach the dog touch and then I put my hand behind the bell and then do touch. And so when they touch it, it makes the bell move and ring. Or you can teach your dog to paw the bell. Um, but any, yeah, you can pair any word with the bell. I usually say like, oh, do you need to go potty? Okay, let's go ring the bell and then outside and then I reward them and say good potty. But if you say outside, that's totally fine. So, yep, that's good. Good job. Um, Danny or Danny? I'm going to say Danny. Um, wow, from Australia. Um, okay, four-month-old Labradoodle barks when I'm eating my dinner and jumps at me to get my food. Okay, I'm going to answer that one first. So um, that is demand barking, and I would ignore that. Um, if it's hard to get through a meal because your dog is demand barking, um, then I would put him in another place. Um, and actually, I don't know if it's a he or a she, so sorry if I get the sex wrong. Um, so while you're eating, um, you know, you could put your dog in a crate with a chew item. You could teach a go to your place and settle. So teach them to like to go to a mat or a bed and you get your bully stick while I'm eating. Um, you can put them in another room, put them outside just so they can't practice that behavior. Um, you can't ignore it. And if you, if you ignore it long enough, it'll eventually go away because nothing good is going to come from it. You just have to make sure that you're not giving the dog attention and nobody can feed the dog from the table. Because even if one person does, then um, the dog gets reinforced for that. And then they're going to continue to bark um, and try to get attention. So with demand barking, especially if the dog is jumping at you to get your food, that is like a big no-no. Um, so I, I would teach, you could do a downstay. So it's like you do a downstay while I eat. Um, and you can intermittently like toss treats to the dog, like not your food. Um, and I wouldn't even have it come from the table. I would maybe have a treat bag on and intermittently toss treats for a good downstay. But I would almost rather have the dog not even at the table. So teaching like a go to your mat, go to your place, um, crate the dog with a good chew item while you're eating, just so the dog can't practice that behavior. Um, okay, and then um, your six-year-old Maltese mix fox terrier winds and barks in the car. So it depends on why the Maltese is whining and barking. If it's an anxiety issue, um, I have found, I have one, I have a dog that's very anxious in the car, so I create her because the fast moving stuff and all the environmental stuff is just like really scary for her. So um, I create her um, so that it's kind of a safe place. She can't see what's going on outside and um, it make, it just helps her to be a little bit more calm. So if it's an anxiety issue, I would create your dog. Um, if it's all of the distractions and if it's reactivity, then I would then at first I would like sit in your car in a parking lot and play the look at that game. So let's say you sit in the parking lot at a grocery store. Every time your dog, and I would park way on the, the farthest parking spot you can so that from a distance your dog sees a person click tree now this is looking at a person and staying calm if your dog reacts then you have to move farther away you might have to park across the street but you want to start at a distance to where your dog can just look at the 
person, like people getting out of their car, walking around, whatever. Um, and they can just notice it, click treat. Notice it, click treat. Then you can move a little bit closer. Then you can start to move like drive um, so that you're moving. It helps so that you don't crash to have a helper. So I, I, what I do with clients that have reactive dogs in the car is I will have them drive. Um, the dog's either in the middle or on, depending on how big the dog is. And while she's driving around, I'm like, oh, look, there's a person. Click three. If the dog starts to bark, I have the owner turn and go the other way so that we increase distance. As long as the dog can just stay calm and like, oh, look, there's a person, click treat. Oh, look, there's a car moving, click treat. So we're teaching to look at that. But with one person driving, we can kind of control distance a little bit so that if the dog does react, then we increase distance. If the dog can stay calm, then you can start to decrease distance. Um, <clears throat> so again, it depends on why. Um, if it's an anxiety thing, I would try crating. You can also um, do medication. So if you know you're going to be in the car, you can do like a situational med, which just means you give it to your dog like an hour before you're going to go in the car. And it can help with anxiety. You can try the crate. Um, but if it's a reactivity thing, then I would do the look at that. Um, Okay. The right way to train, potty train an eight-week-old puppy. Um, yes. And before I forget, let me write down Travis. If you just told me where he's from, so I don't want to forget. In Canada. Okay. Um, Actually, Travis, you, you still qualify. So they don't ship um, outside of the USA or Canada, but Canada um, still works. So you are entered um, into the drawing. Okay, so what I do with an eight-week-old puppy is the first thing is that I start to crate train because most dogs will not potty where they sleep. And then you want to let the dog out first thing in the morning half hour after eating, after a nap, after a training session, um, and after a play session, if it's indoors, the more active a dog is, the more they're gonna have to potty. And then I would take the dog out every half hour, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on your dog. Um, if the dog goes out and doesn't potty, I put them back in the crate because you don't want them to like them not potty outside and come in and go inside. Then if the dog does potty and goes number one and number two, then they can come in and have like free access. I would still supervise because puppies are going to get into things and chew and stuff like that. Um, you can also tether the dog to you. So tie, you know, clip the dog to your belt loop and, um, and then you can kind of, Tell when dogs start sniffing and circling. It's like, oh, do you need to go potty? Let's go outside and go potty. Um, so I had a client today that showed me the coolest app. And I didn't get the name of it. But I bet if you if you have an iPhone or if you Google it, you could probably find it. But what it is is it's kind of like this log. And so she can log like what time, like all she does is get in. So we were training and I said, I think your dog might need to go poop because I could just tell by the way she was walking. So sure enough, she went out and went potty. So she put it on her app and just put like poop. And so then the app keeps track of like, okay, the dog went at this time, this time, this time. So it's more light. It's most likely that the dog's going to go again at this time and it sends you an alert. It is the most awesome thing I've ever seen. And so it can keep track of potty schedules. Um, next time I see her, I will, I will get the name of it. But um, I've always like, I mean, I've never had that when I had puppies growing up. And when I board and train puppies, I just do it this, you know, my normal way. 
Um, if you don't catch your dog having an accident, then, sorry, I had to make sure I had all four dogs here. Um, if you don't catch your dog, there's nothing you can do after the fact, except clean it up. Um, if you catch your dog having an accident, then you can interrupt. I usually say, hey, uh, 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 and I'll clap my hands. Not loud enough to like scare the dog, but just enough to kind of make them go, <gasps> like just a startle response because then they'll usually like stop going. And then you can immediately take them outside and say, okay, go potty. Um, so if you can't supervise, the dog's in the crate. As long as you can supervise, and again, you can tether the dog to you or just have them in the same room, but watch them. Um, like I could tell with this dog because we were training and then all of a sudden the dog went off to the other side and started sniffing. And I noticed like the back legs were kind of stiff, the tail was stiff. And sure enough, she did need to go. Um, so yeah, if you, if you catch them, interrupt to take them outside. Um, but yeah, I try at the beginning to take them out like every hour. Um, and you can, like, you could keep your own log. Like, you don't need the app even. Just say, like, okay, at 945, the dog peed. And then kind of notice when she goes again. So then it's like, okay, so you're going about every 45 minutes. So I'm going to take you out every 45 minutes. Um, then when they go outside, when they first start to go praise and say, oh, good potty. So you're praising for going outside and in, in an appropriate place. The reward is actually relieving your bladder or your bowel. So like that's the reward for the dog, but you can still give a secondary reward as a treat if you want, which most people do because then it's like a treat to the dog for going potty outside. Um, so yeah, just first thing in the morning, after eating, after naps, after play sessions, after training sessions, um, and then almost like every 45 minutes in between, depending on the dog. So that's, that's how I do it, and it's always worked. So, okay. Now I've got to get this to scroll again. Um, okay, let me write a few more names down. Um, oh, and then we have another question about potty training. So hopefully you just heard my last, um, oh, we've got three or four questions on potty training. So hopefully you just heard that whole spiel. So that will help. Um, let me write down a few more names. Okay. Any tips? on overexcited dogs when they see people or other dogs. I mean, really excited, barking and jumping and pretty much walking on her back legs. Yeah, so what I do is um, the reward can be that they get to say hi to the other dog or the other person, but not if they're pulling. So if a dog starts pulling towards a person, I change direction. So their pulling makes them go the other way. But then it's important to teach the dog what you want them to do instead. So I will like teach a sit and a wait. So it's like you sit and you wait and then have the person approach. If your dog gets up and starts to move towards them, ask the person to step back. So it's a good impulse control exercise. So if the dog doesn't wait, that causes the person to go away or the dog. The other, if you're going to use another dog, have the other dog on leash. Um, if your dog sits and waits, that causes the person or the dog to get closer, and then they can say hi. Like they can give your dog a treat, they can pet, get attention, as long as the dog is calm. Once they start petting the dog, if your dog like starts jumping, like my dog does that, if she gets really excited and jumps, then I ask them to step back, or I will ask her for another sit. So the dog only gets attention when they're sitting um, and being calm. 
otherwise it causes the person to, to move away or the dog to move away. It's actually part of the canine good citizen task. The dog has to sit and wait by the owner's side and a stranger has to approach. And if the dog moves towards the person, then the stranger backs away. Um, and then if the stranger can come all the way up and say, hi, can I pet your dog? And if the dog like stays there, then they pet him, they say hi, and that's a pet. If the dog moves, it's a fail. So yeah, I basically teach impulse control. So, you know, if you wait, then yeah, they'll come up and you can say hi to them. If you don't wait, they're going to go away. And if you're on your back legs pulling me, we're going to turn around and go the other way. So try that. Um, okay. Let me write down a few more names. There's a lot of people here for the day before Thanksgiving, and I'm excited. Um, we got Karen. I'm going to write down Melissa while I have you here. Um, what are some fun tricks to teach your dog? Mine will go get me a tissue box if I pretend to sneeze. He will jump through a hula hoop. He can close doors. Any other fun recommendations? Oh, I love that question. Um, so I teach my dog to spin, which is really easy. You just hold the tree in front and lure them. Let me see if I, oh, come here. Let me see if I can get Jay to do it, even though I don't have any treats right now. Come here. Can you spin? Like, oh, I'm just going to get on your lap. It does work better if you have treats. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Here, you spin? Yeah, good girl. Good girl. Spin. Yeah, good spin. Good girl. It also doesn't help that I have another dog right here in my face. Um, and so I have, I have, um, like, spin is one way and then turn is the other. Um, so you can do that. I You can teach rollover pretty easy. Um, I just had a client's daughter teach her dog to sit and wait. And then she had these two crates with a broom. And then she would call the dog and the dog would like jump over the broom and go to her. It was, I mean, the girl's like 12 years old. So it was actually really cute that, that she taught her dog to do that. Um, so yeah, you can do spin, roll over. Um, another fun one is every dog time your dog stretches or does like like that play bow, um, you know where they go down. I did that where every time my dog would stretch in the morning, I would click and treat. Or if we were outside and and he did a play bow, click and treat. And I did that for like a month until finally. He started offering it because it's like, oh, when I do this, I get a reward. And then I named it Take a Bow. So then I could say Take a Bow, and he would like bow. Um, you can also shape it by taking a tree to the ground and sliding it in so that the dog has to kind of bend their elbows and like go into that position to get the treat. You can shape it as well. Um, so, and I believe that Pupford has. A training course on tricks. Um, I didn't do it, but another trainer did it. I haven't seen it yet, but I bet that it would be awesome. I bet it would be really cool. Um, and I also know that there's um, some books from Amazon that you can get on on doing tricks. So, um, yeah, that's a good question because doing tricks is something that's really fun. It's very good for your dog because they have to use their brain. And anytime you do shaping exercises, it's really good for your brain, your dog's brain. It's something you can do right now with COVID and you have to social distance. If the weather's bad and you can't get outside, um, it's good to do as well. So um, I have, oh, that same, that same girl is now trying to teach the dog to like go open the fridge and get out a drink and I mean that's a little more advanced but it can totally be, be done there's a thing called reverse chaining where you teach the last 
thing first. So like first she would teach the dog to gently grab a drink, um, like do the take, and then, you know, then you can teach bring it to you. Then you can teach the dog to open the fridge door. Although I don't know if I would teach your dog that if you get, give them free roam of the house because then they might do it when you're not home. Um, we did that with a service dog once with a, a kid that was in a really bad motorcycle accident. And so we were teaching the dog how to bring him a drink. And it was funny because the dog would take it and would grab it. But one time he grabbed it too hard and punctured it. And since we'd been practicing, it got shaken up. And then like this was like spinning and spraying Diet Coke everywhere. So you have to kind of be careful with that. Um, but that's an awesome trick that to bring you a tissue box. I think that's amazing. Um, okay, if I think of other tricks as I'm going along, I'll I'll chime in. I'm trying to think if I I like teaching my dog. I mean, I teach my dogs to speak on cue, but that's because I I use it for training sometimes. Um, so I will teach them to speak. Um. I can't remember, you know, the other stuff that I do, but if I think of it, I'll um, chime in. Okay, so need help with my pup jumping on guests. Okay, so hopefully you heard my spiel before, um, but I'll kind of go through it again. So remember that dogs will do what works for them. So if they jump for attention, and if they get attention, even if it's somebody saying, hey, get down, get down, get off, that's still attention. So you need to tell the, tell your guests, like, turn your back and ignore the dog until the dog has four on the floor. And then you can tell the dog to sit and the person can then say hi when the dog's sitting. If the dog then gets excited and jumps up again, you tell the person to turn their back and you tell the dog to sit. So today I was actually in the grocery store practicing with Jade and there was a guy who said, oh, she's so cute. Can I um, say hi? And I said, yes, as long as she doesn't jump on you. If she jumps, I want you to stop petting her. So I put her in a sit and the guy started petting and then she did kind of jump up a little bit. So he backed off. I put her back in a sit. It worked beautifully. So yeah, and the important thing is that everybody, it needs to be consistent. A lot of people will come over and say, oh, I don't mind, I love dogs. And you're like, well, but I'm trying to teach the dog not to do it. Because it's confusing to the dog if they can jump on some people, but not other people. Um, so yeah, it's called negative punishment. So negative means you're taking something away, which is your attention, because you want the jumping not to continue. But then you've got to teach the dog what you want them to do instead, which is sit. Because if the dog is sitting, they're not jumping. They can't. If, if a dog is sitting down, they can't be jumping. So that's the best way to do it. Um, okay, this is a good question. Dog barks at the doorbell and then barks at guests upon entry. She quickly stops once they come in and say hi to her, but she sounds terrifying. Her hair spikes up when this all happens. Okay. Um, so the pilo erection, which is the hackles going up when you say that her hair spikes up, all that means is the dog is aroused by something. Um, or is like, so we even see it in puppy class. Like the dogs get overly aroused and their they their hair spikes up. Sometimes when they see another dog, their hair can spike up. Um, sometimes it can be like, it's just kind of like they're taking notice of something or they just notice something in their environment. Um, so the first thing I would do is desensitize your dog to the doorbell. So the way I do that is there are free apps you can get or you can use YouTube. Um, and you start with the volume really low and when you play the doorbell, as soon as your dog hears it, it's treat, 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 treat. When the sound stops, the treat stops. So doorbell equals treats. No doorbell means no treat. 
If your dog can stay calm, then you raise the level like one notch, which is nice when you do it on your phone because you can just do your up button like one. And so you're gradually increasing the volume. But, um, and then if you're like, say, at a certain volume and your dog barks, then back off on the volume. So you're starting really soft and doorbell equals treats. When it's quiet, the treats stop. And then you slowly increase the doorbell. So that would desensitize them to the doorbell ringing. Um, and then you can start to teach the dog what you want them to do when they hear the doorbell. So I usually will teach like a go to your place or a sit wait at the door. So when they hear the doorbell, choose a spot, sit, wait, and start to open the door. If the dog moves, the door closes. So when I teach this, I put a sign on my door that says dog in training, thanks for your patience. Um, I'll probably close the door in your face, don't be offended, something like that. So if the dog moves, it's the same thing with the greeting. If the dog moves, the door closes. If they wait, the door opens, you can invite the people in and say, okay, go say hi. And then you can release the dog to go say hi. So, yeah, the first thing I would do is desensitize the doorbell and then teach the dog what you want them to do instead. Another thing that you can do is Google um, Karen Overall's relaxation protocol because it teaches a dog to be calm on a mat with increasing distractions. And one of those is knocking on the door or ringing the doorbell. So you literally start with the dog being calm for five seconds, then 10 seconds, then 15 seconds. Then you slowly add in distractions like clapping your hands, turning around, walking away, knocking on the door. So, you know, so I just knocked and my dog will stay quiet. One kind of woke up like, oh, I just heard something knock, but I'm gonna go back to sleep. Um, so you could do that too. I. I will type that into the chat thing just so um, just so you know what to Google. Um, so you, you can try those, but yeah, I would desensitize first to the sound of the doorbell, and then teach your dog either go to your place or. Um, or do the relaxation to teach them to be calm when the doorbell rings. And then I usually don't let the dogs like greet somebody until um, until they're calm. Like if they're all excited, I mean, they can be excited, but they just can't be jumping and stuff on people or barking. Okay, I'm trying to get this to scroll again. I don't know why I have so many problems. Um, Emily, no, I have not done the drawing yet. I'm going to do it in about 15 minutes. Actually, we could we could do it now since oh there it's scrolling. Um, so Anita, can you recommend a car harness that would be safe if accident occurred? I don't know the brand of car harnesses, but I know there's a lot of harnesses like on Amazon where you have a harness and it actually clips into the car. Um, so the dog stays in one spot. I personally, well, I can't say that I do that with every dog because I don't have room. One of my dogs always rides in a crate, um, but she hates riding in the car, so it's less anxious for her. Um, so having your dog in a crate is going to be the safest because even if the crate gets tossed out, you're your dog's going to be more like secure inside. Um, but I honestly don't know any brands of car harnesses, but if you look on Amazon or even probably Chewy.com might have some and just kind of look and, and see, look at the comments and see what they say. I honestly, I have never used them. So um, my dogs usually just lay on the back seat and then one's in a crate. So um, okay, let's do the drawing, and then if we have a few more questions, I'm happy to stay and answer. Um, um, hi, Kathy. 
So Kathy's here in South Jordan. Okay, let's do the drawing and then I'll go back and answer Travis's question and I'll answer some more questions. Um, okay, so I've got to put all of these in a bowl and draw. Okay, so today's winner is Ashley Hunsberger from Ohio. So congratulations, Ashley. Um, if you um, email Pupford at hello at Pupford.com, let them know what flavor of training treats you want. I will also email them tonight and let them know you're the winner. And they will send you a free bag of training treats. So congratulations, Ashley. Um, Let's see, I have a question. How to prevent my dog from stealing another dog's toy at the dog park and won't give it back? Oh, very interesting. Um, so I would teach either a leave it. If you see your dog going to steal another dog's toy, I would teach a leave it. If he gets it, I would teach a drop it. Um, but make sure you have so that if you do a drop it, you can reward him for dropping it and then I would give it back. I mean, if people are throwing balls and stuff, it's going to be normal for for dogs to go chase balls and whoever's fastest gets it. I am I actually am not a fan of people taking toys to a dog park because it can cause fights. However, I like to chuck it and throwing the ball to give your dog exercise. I've seen a lot of people do that, and that's totally fine. But just Kind of keep in the back of your head that if you have a dog that's a resource guarder, it could lead to a fight. I mean, there could be problems. If your dog's just stealing it because he's faster, um, then I would just teach like, you know, I mean, he's just being a dog. And it depends. Like if he's chasing a ball and just gets there faster and takes it, if a dog actually like has a toy and is chewing on it and your dog goes up and takes it, um, I'm surprised the other dog doesn't like growl. I mean, some dogs won't. Like, you could take anything from Daphne and she won't do anything. Um, but I would, I if you see your dog getting ready to do it, I would say, hey, leave it. And then when they hear leave it, they should um, learn that, oh, that means I get something better. So I'm going to get a reward for leaving that. Or if they grab it, then do a drop it and drop it and give it back to the owner or the other dog. So that's what I would do. Um, how to train my dog to be less vocal in playing with others. So I'm assuming you mean other dogs. Um, some dogs are very vocal when they play. Um, my mice are very, very vocal when they play. If you heard Jade play, you'd think she's being aggressive because she will growl and bark, but she's just playing. It, it can sound vicious, but it's a play bark. Um, and that's just some dog's play style. So I don't really correct that just um, because it depends on the dog and, and their playing. Um, so, I mean, you could give a timeout. like. You could give them out and just say, okay, gotcha. I'm going to take you out, give you a one minute timeout, and then let her go back in and play. Um, you have to time it so that it's when she's barking really loud that she gets the timeout. So she makes that association. So it's like when I'm barking loud, I get taken out. But honestly, I don't try and train that out um, just because it's just a play style and dogs have different play styles. So um yeah as long as she's having fun and as long as the other dogs don't mind then i would just honestly let her let her do it but yeah you could do some um some brief timeouts if you wanted um oh so somebody oh travis said i have a true enhanced harness by kurgo that tethers to the seatbelt 
Awesome. So thank you for that um, recommendation. That's awesome. Um, Shayala, sorry if I ruined your first name. I might get a puppy soon. Do you know what dogs are easiest to train? Well, you are asking somebody who is partial to pit bulls. So that's probably not a good question to ask me. I've had, oh, I've had several different breeds growing up. Um, I've had German Shepherd. They're, they're easy to train, very high energy. Um, I also had a mutt kind of once that was an English pointer slash something slash something. He was easy to train. Um, my, I've had eight pit bulls now and they have been really easy to train. In fact, three, well, two of them have been service dogs and one's a service dog in training. Um, labs are pretty easy to train. Um, I think anybody that has a certain breed is going to tell you, oh, my breed is really easy to train because people just have their preferences. Um, but I would say out of all the different, and I, I do a lot of board and train and I do have a lot of clients, um, you know, with different dogs, obviously I don't just work with pit bulls, but I think German shepherds are, are very smart and very trainable. Um, they're, they do bark a lot and they have a lot of energy. So you know, make sure that you can give them plenty of mental stimulation. The nice thing about like German Shepherds and even labs is you can do nose work with them. You can do search and rescue with them. You can do um, a lot of things with them because especially if you get one that has a high drive, even if you do it for fun, you know, like doing nose work and, and stuff like that could be fun. Um, pit bulls aren't good at search and rescue, so I don't do that with them, but they're fun to do tricks with, and I found them to be very easy to train. So, um, yeah, that's that's it. that's my answer, but I'm partial. So, anyway. Um, yarn it out. Yeah, it would be great if they teach tricks on channel. You know, on YouTube, they're probably our YouTube um, videos on teaching tricks. So if you type in like how to teach tricks, I'm sure there's tons of videos on that. Um, just make sure that they're using science-based based methods and no like corrections, no like choke collars or um, we don't want anything that molds the dog, meaning like pushing on them to sit or forcing them to do something. It should all be done with like shaping or capturing um, or luring. So, um, yeah, I, I have a book that I got on Amazon. And the reason I got it is because I went to a workshop and this lady was there. And I think it's called 101 or 100 Dog Tricks. Um, I honestly haven't gotten that far into it. But, um, you know, you could check that out, too. So, um, Travis, you're talking about the unwanted jumping, but can you invite them to jump only on cue? Yes, and I actually do that. So, with Jade, um, I I do say up, and I'll tap my lap and allow her to jump, and then I'll say hi to her. But then I also teach um, I'll teach up, and then I'll teach off. And then when she gets off, she gets a treat up. So we practice up, off, up, off. So she knows the difference. I mean, that's how I, I kind of teach the off. And then to teach the off, like I put a treat right in front of her nose and lure her off. And as soon as her feet leave me, I click and treat. Um, but when greeting somebody else, I put her in a sit. And then if she does jump, I do an off. But um, absolutely. I don't think I would do it with a really young dog because we don't want to confuse them. But once your dog like isn't obnoxiously jumping for attention, then yes, 
And I, I do that with my dogs. I do teach them an up and I teach them an off. So, yeah, because I, I have bad knees. So I like it when they, you know, I can invite them up and then I can set up them and stuff like that. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see, Julie. When we kick around a ball for her to get her energy out, she starts to go after her legs and feet. I'm trying to get her to stop doing it by standing still, or when she guards the ball, I'll wait until she sits next to it. I mean, it's hard to get my kids to stop running around. Um, yeah, so... What, what I would use is maybe try a flirt pole. The reason for that is because it's attached and it's far out. So like I hold the flirt pole and then I ask the dog to sit and then I'll throw the toy out and say, go. And then I'll swing it around in a circle. And because it has a long end on it, the dog is away from you and the dog's not like going for your feet because it's going for the toy that's way around. Then I let the dog catch the toy, play tug, whatever. And then I'll teach drop by by showing them a treat, um, do drop it. When they get the treat, then I pick the toy up and then I stop the game. Then I ask them to sit again and then I throw it out, go. And then I go the other way. So you don't want to go back and forth because that's really bad on their joints. But one time I'll go clockwise, one time I'll go counterclockwise. Um, but it keeps the dog away from your feet. Um, and with her guarding the ball, that's why I teach a drop it. So I'll take a really yummy treat. So for this, I actually use the pup for salmon treats because they're high value and they, they're smelly, so dogs love them. So, you know, I'll show them a salmon treat and I'll say drop it. And then as soon as they drop it, click, they, when they're taking the treat, I pick up the toy. Um, as far as getting your kids to stop running around, um, that is all on you because I don't have kids, so I don't know how to train kids. But I know some of the principles are the same. So I have found that if you can get kids involved in training, it helps to engage them. So you can give them a turn with the flirt pole, like going around and around and around. And then I would have you do the drop it. Um, and then you can say like, okay, we're going to play something with the dog and I need you guys. And this is actually what I do with kids for dogs that are biting and jumping, um, on kids. I say, okay, we're going to pretend like we're trees. So we're going to be big, strong oak trees. So you're going to stand really still and fold in your branches and look at the sky. And you're going to stay like that for five seconds. And so if you involve them and help them. To, to think like, oh, I'm helping with training, then they're more likely to do that. Because they're going to want to run around and play with the dog too. But then it's like, okay, if you don't have the flirt pole, then you're an oak tree. If you do have the flirt pole, you're going to stand there and like make the toy move so the dog can chase it. Once the dog gets it, you can play tug. Um, you can do that. And then I would have the adult do the drop it. Um, and then, and then you pick up the toy and then another kid gets it and then it's their turn and the kid that just did it becomes the oak tree. So maybe try that. Um, okay. Should snuffle mats only be used at feeding time? Do you just use their kibble? Um, I use them as enrichment every day, not just at feeding time. I do feed one of my dogs in a snuffle mat only because she eats really fast and then wants to go eat her. Um, so just to slow her down, I do feed her in there and then I do use their kibble. But as an enrichment, fun activity during the day, I will use a snuffle mat and use treats. So no, it doesn't always have to be kibble, but it can be. Um, and 
I do it at other times during the day just for fun and enrichment. Um, especially for the other two dogs because they don't need to eat in a snuffle mat. Um, they snuff down their food, but they don't finish before Jade, who then wants to go eat, you know, Daphne's food. Um, so yeah, for just something fun, then I'll just say, hey, hey, we're going to do snuffle mat. And so, but it is, again, like um, supervised, our supervised bully stick. So I'll do like one snuffle mat in the kitchen um, with the baby gate closed, one maybe outside, one in another room, just so they can enjoy it without having to worry about, oh, one of the other dogs is going to come and take my stuff. If you just have one dog, you don't need to worry about that. But I have three. So um, I, I like to separate them just so they can enjoy it and not have to worry about one of the other dogs coming over. Um, so yeah, I do it at different times of the day. I, I do it on days when we're having really bad weather and I can't get them out, um, cause it's really good enrichment. And so if I'm doing it, it as an enrichment activity, I will use treats. If I'm doing it at feeding time, then I use kibble. Um, oh, Danica. How do you stop a puppy from digging? Okay, so there's a couple things you can do. Um, one thing is to have a designated digging spot, or you could do like a sandbox like you would do for kids and you know fill it with dirt or whatever. You can hide toys in there, hide treats in there. And then if you if you see the dog digging somewhere, redirect them like, uh-uh-uh, this is where you dig. Kind of like potty training. You interrupt, show them where their digging spot is. If you hide stuff in the sand or the dirt so they have to dig through and find their treasures, it's going to make it a lot more fun to dig in that spot. Um, the other thing you could do, we used to do this at the rescue, is we got one of those big kitty pools, and we filled it with rubber balls like about this size like all different colors not that the dog cares the dogs don't care what color it is but we fill it with balls and again we'll hide treats and toys and stuff and the dogs love to jump in there and dig through the balls and find the treats and the toys um and it's not as muddy like if you have a sandbox outside and your dog's digging and it's wet that can get messy but the, um, the pool thing works. So either do the kitty pool with the balls or have a designated spot. You could even have, you know, if you don't have a sandbox, like have one designated spot where the dogs can dig. So like I recently moved my dog's swimming pool um, on the other side of the yard where it's closer to the water so I can fill it up. So I have this big dead spot on my lawn where the pool used to be and the dogs like to dig and lay in it because it's cool. So I let them dig in that one spot. If I see them digging somewhere else, I'll just interrupt, say, hey, uh, 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 and then I bring them over like, here, you can dig right here. So I, I have one designated digging spot for that. Um, okay. Oh, Kayla, we love the flirt pole. I know, I do too. I love it. And I bought the expensive one off of Amazon before Pupford came out with theirs. So I bought a bunch from Pupford just be, to sell to like my clients because I like that they're retractable. So they're small. Because I have this huge flirt pole in my car that doesn't really fit anywhere convenient, but the nice little retractable ones I can stick right in my bag and then just pull it out. So yeah, I think the fur poles are great. You can also make your own. Not, they wouldn't be that hard to make. Maybe for me, because I'm not crafty, but it's just kind of like a fishing pole. Um, okay, my eight month old female lab attacks my six-year-old male lab went on the way outside how to correct them. Um, 
So is it happening like at the doorway? Because sometimes when you have um, closed spaces, so you see this a lot like in stairs or in doorways. So whenever you have like closed space and if a dog feels like they can't escape or they can't get out, um, then sometimes that can do that or that can um, cause that. Um, so what I would do is when you get to the doorway, ask the dogs to sit and wait and then let one dog go through and then another dog go through. So have them like go through separately. Um, and um, you could also leash them but have them on different sides on different sides do a sit and a wait and then say okay let's go and then take them both out but on opposite sides um so you could you could try that too um i would also do some impulse control stuff with the lab the female the puppy um where you do sit and wait allow the six-year-old dog to go out and then reward the puppy and then let the puppy go out. Um, so that's that's what what I would do is impulse control. So like sit and wait, but try to not have the two dogs going through the door at the same time. Because like I said, with some dogs in enclosed spaces, that can sometimes happen. Um, Okay, let's see. How to stop your dog to bark at other dogs. Oh, thank you, Julie. If you guys are leaving um, and don't wanna stay for all the questions, um, happy Thanksgiving, have a happy holiday. Everybody stay safe. Um, so thanks, Julie. And then I, I'll answer a few more questions. Um, how to stop your dog to bark at other dogs. So for that, I like to do the look at that game. So I start with, um, if you have a friend with a nice mellow dog that can help you, awesome. If not, go to a, a parking lot like at a vet clinic or Petco and start at a distance to where your dog can just look at another dog and not react. If your dog barks, you need to increase distance. So start Start at that distance where your dog can notice another dog, but not bark, and then do the look at that game. So it's like, look at the dog, click treat. And I do use a clicker for this, and I'll explain why. So it's like, look at the dog, click treat. Look at the dog, click treat. So you're clicking for the dog just noticing the other dog and not reacting. Then your dog will start to like, hear the click and learn to disengage and be like, oh, I heard the clicker, where's my treat? Um, and then eventually the dog will like look at a dog, oh, look, I just saw a dog, where's my treat? Then you can slowly decrease distance. So, but one step at a time. When I do my reactive dog classes, sorry, I'm getting the hiccup. Um, it's funny, I'll say, okay, move one step closer and some people will go one, two, three, four. It's like, that's not one step. And a dog could go over threshold. It's literally one step at a time. Then go one step closer. And then like, look at that. So if you have a helper, it's easier because then you can control distances better. Um, if you don't have a helper, then you could practice at Home Depot. Petco, if your dog starts to react, then just say, let's go, and you're going to do a turn and go. You're going to turn and go the other way. But as long as your dog can just look at another dog, click treat, and then slowly decrease the distance. We do this over a six-week course, and by the end of six weeks, usually reactive dogs can one step at a time get closer and then come up and greet one of my dogs. So it really does work. Um, and I think this is you saying something else. I'm having a hard time scrolling again. Um, 
when we walk and he sees another dog, he barks. When he gets close, he stops and smells, but as soon as the dog leaves, he will start barking. Yeah, and I mean, it could be a, a fear thing. Um, sometimes dogs will bark if their environment changes. So um, I would still do the look at that. And so you're teaching the dog a different behavior. Instead of reacting, I want you to just look at the dog and I'll reward you. And then they can sniff. And then as the dog, the other dog starts to move away, teach something else. Like, like do a look at me or do a hand target, something that's incompatible with barking. So it's like, while the dog's walking away, look at me, I'll treat you. Watch me, I'll treat you. Do a touch, I'll treat you. And so... And so while the dog's walking away, you're having your dog do other easy tasks um, and getting rewarded for them instead of the barking. So, so it's kind of like desensitizing the dog from people leaving, but teach a different behavior that you can reward. Um, okay. I am losing my voice, so I'm going to answer one more and then probably end for tonight, but I'll be back next Wednesday. Um, dog bolts in and out of the car. How do you stop this? We drive a minivan. Oh, so can't close the door fast enough to teach weight. Um, can you use, well, so if your dog bolts and you have a minivan, I would use a crate and then teach weight as you open the crate door. If the dog starts to bolt, close the door. So I would teach weight that way first and have your dog ride in a crate in the minivan and teach weight. Um, and then the minivans that I've been around, you can actually control how far they open. So you can do weight and then just start to open it. If the dog starts to move, then you close it. If it's like an electric, the electric one that just opens on its own and you can't control it, um, then I would I, I would start with wait at home. So like wait at the door, wait in your crate, wait while I open the door. If you move, I'm going to close the door. Um, so I would teach wait outside of the minivan first at different places, different doors, and then see if you can transfer that over to the minivan. Um, I'm trying to think of the minivans I've been around. Do they have like, do they open from the back at all? Is there a door that opens or is it just the two that slide? Um, you could theoretically, like you could have the dog on a leash. If you have another person to help you, like have the driver like hold the dog on a leash while you open the door. Um, and then if the dog's pulling, you just keep doing wait. And then when the dog is sitting there calmly, then the drive, then you can release the dog to come out. But yeah, that's a good question. That might be hard with a minivan. I'll have to see who I know with the minivan and see if I can um, work through that. But I would definitely teach wait in other situations first. So um, front door, you know, different doors in your house, crate, things like that, teach you really good weight, and then move it over into the um, minivan. Okay, I'm going to answer one more. I do this every week. I'm going to answer one more just because it's on puppy biting, and I get asked this a lot, so I'll hurry and answer this one. Um, so... I learned this from another trainer and I, I really like it. So it's called the three bite strike rule, the three strike bite rule, which is however you want to say it. So the first time your puppy grabs um, clothes or skin, you can do like, hey, uh-uh, or ouch, and then redirect to a toy. And I don't do like a loud ouch because I don't want I don't want it to seem like I'm yelling at the dog. 
because he's just being a puppy. Like, puppies are going to bite. Um, so the first time you redirect to a toy, so it's like, oh, you can't touch, you can't bite me, but here's your toy. Here, play with your toy. If the dog leaves the toy and goes back to biting you, then calmly pick up your puppy with the toy, put him in a crate for one to two minutes. So you're putting the toy in there with the puppy so that it's not a punishment. Let the puppy um, kind of decompress, chill for one to two minutes, let, and then let her out. If she goes right back to biting you again, that's strike three. Calmly, so the dog's not in trouble. Calmly pick her up, put her back in the crate with a toy, cover the crate, and and then she gets a longer timeout. And it's mainly so that you can have a timeout. When puppies get that riled where they just want to bite, 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 um, a lot of times they need a nap, they need some chill time, they're getting overly excited. Um, so first time, redirect. Second time, one to two minute timeout with a toy. Third time, longer timeout, cover the crate. In the summertime, you can actually put a fan on so they don't get too hot. But then they get a longer timeout to really decompress and um, like chill. So um, that's what I do. So um, thank you everybody for joining. We had a lot more people tonight for um, being the day before holiday than I thought we would. So I'm glad everybody came out and congratulations again, Ashley Huntsberger from Ohio. You're our lucky winner tonight for the free training treats. Um, and if I didn't get your question answered, I'm sorry, I do try to get on um, the 30 day Facebook group. Um, I try to do every day except Sunday to answer questions. So you can put your question on there um, or join me next week and um, same time, six o'clock mountain time. And I'll try to get your question answered um, then as well. So everybody have a great holiday, stay safe. Um, and thanks for joining and we'll see you next week.